Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm your host, Steve Lance. Here's a look at some of the stories we have coming up for you today. President Biden had his first press conference in months, as the latest polls show his job approval hitting new lows. Russia is sending more troops toward Ukraine's border, and the U.S. is sending millions to help with defense. Today, Secretary of State Blinken visited Ukraine and warned that Putin could launch an attack on very short notice. Senator Todd Young tells NTD why this is cause for concern. And organizers of a vaccine mandate march this Sunday say that thousands of people are coming to Washington, D.C. to speak out against the mandates. This is in the face of the predominant Omicron strain where vaccines are proving to have little to no effect. Prominent cardiologist Dr. Peter McCullough will be giving a speech at this event. He's here with us to discuss. Today, President Biden held his first press conference in months, just a day before the one-year anniversary of his inauguration. It comes at a challenging time as the latest polls show his job approval hitting new lows. The past year has been filled with setbacks for President Biden. I know there's a lot of frustration and fatigue in this country. A resurgence of COVID, inflation reaching a 39-year high, voting bills under partisan rancor, foreign policy challenges looming large, his approval rating falling below 40 percent. But the president says it's all a year of progress. We went from 2 million people being vaccinated at the moment I was sworn in to 210 million Americans being fully vaccinated. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we're about to make a record investment in rebuilding America to take us to be the number one best infrastructure in the world. With the midterm elections less than 10 months away, Biden and Democrats are continuing to try and pass the Build Back Better agenda. If price increases are what you're worried about, the best answer is my Build Back Better plan. Biden will give his first State of the Union on March 1st. U.S. officials are keeping a close eye on escalating tensions overseas as Russia sends more troops toward Ukraine's border. Today, Secretary Blinken visited Ukraine, warning officials that Putin could launch an attack on short notice. Senator Todd Young tells NTD why this is cause for concern. NTD's Melina Wisecup reports. A group of senators today highlighting their concern for the intense situation on the Ukraine border. And although this group was made up of all Republicans, they wanted to emphasize the fact that both parties, Republicans and Democrats, are unified with support behind Ukraine during this tense time. The president this morning met with some of these senators to discuss how they'll move forward to tackle this threat. Uh, this morning's briefing with the president was uh, informative and I think constructive. And, uh, and I think uh, at this point, the, uh, the message is loud and clear. The United States stands as one. Senator Todd Young tells us that the U.S. must show resolve handling Russian aggression to prevent other autocrats from feeling emboldened to encroach on the free world. If, if we allow Russia to do that in Ukraine, then Xi Jinping uh, will be inclined to do similar things as it relates to Taiwan and other territories. Uh, that fall outside of, of the People's Republic of China and other autocrats will also be incentivized. And that impacts regular Americans. Uh, that impacts our ability to trade, our ability to live freely, uh, and ultimately could find its way to our shores. So um, the United States has, has long been the protector of this uh, free, democratic, open order. And if we don't lead, no one else will. And this is a point Secretary of State Antony Blinken emphasized today as he visited Ukraine. It makes other countries think that they too can violate the rules of international peace and security and put their narrow interests ahead of the shared interests of the international community. Blinken is meeting with Russian officials later this week to urge Russia to de-escalate this as Putin sends more troops toward Ukraine. There's uh, additional uh, heavy military equipment that could be provided to uh, the Ukrainian military that has not yet been provided. Uh, the level of specificity on sanctions uh, needs to be clarified. Melina, what are lawmakers in the Biden administration doing right now to help Ukraine further protect itself? 
Well, aside from that $200 million in military aid for Ukraine, the U.S. is also helping to supply them with weapons. And a bipartisan group of senators right now is working on a bill to sanction Russia in the case that they do launch an attack. And of course, sanctions are something that President Biden has warned Putin of over and over again. If he chooses to invade Ukraine, he will face harsh economic consequences from the U.S. So this is something that really both sides are coming together and working on right now. And lawmakers from both parties are keeping their eyes on. Steve. Thanks for that, Melina. And virus case counts have dropped across the United States in recent days. This reduction is creating hope that the Omicron-fueled wave is subsiding. According to the Epoch Times, 34 states have recorded a decrease in cases in recent days. That includes some of the states that saw a huge Omicron wave, including New York, California, and Florida. Other states that have seen fewer cases recently include Alabama, Delaware, Georgia, and Louisiana. In Maryland and D.C., Omicron also shows signs of declining. Data from the CDC shows the number of daily cases reported nationwide dropped from over 1.3 million on January 10th to below 900,000 in the days following. The Supreme Court has blocked President Biden's vaccine mandate for large-sized companies, but many Americans have still lost their jobs because of the various mandates instituted across multiple sectors. Thousands of people are planning a peaceful march to end the mandates in Washington, D.C. this Sunday. Many prominent doctors and scientists will be attending and speaking at the event. One of those doctors is renowned cardiologist Dr. Peter McCullough. We had a chance to speak with him earlier. Here's what he had to say. Dr. Peter McCullough, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thanks for having me. Doctor, there's a large march scheduled for this weekend in Washington, D.C. From what I understand, you plan to be there to speak. Tell us what's happening there. Yeah, I'll be arriving late, but <clears throat> in time to uh, speak on the stage. Uh, there's a very large event organized in D.C. Uh, it's a uh, basically a peaceful demonstration that is making the case for medical freedom, that people should have uh, the rights to decide uh, what happens to their body from a medical perspective, uh, particularly as it relates to the investigational COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, Americans have seen a year of this now. Uh, the vaccines have largely failed in stopping COVID-19. The most recent variant looks like it's completely resistant to the vaccines. Uh, and we've seen mounting concerns on vaccine safety, including very serious outcomes, including death and disability. Uh, so there's great concern there, but there's also a big push for uh, shared decision making and uh, the principle of autonomy for hospitalized patients. These are principles we've had our entire lifetimes in medicine and people have seen them taken away. Uh, patients have been told, by the way, that they can't even have any word in the uh, say of their care in the hospital. Now, doctor, although the Supreme Court ruled to dismiss one of the major mandates on corporations, there are still many others in place both private and public. Um, a lot of these were put in place a while back. Aside from the argument that there should have never been mandates in the first place, has the science evolved to a point that to the fact that the vaccinations are not necessary to constitute a mandate? That's exactly the case. Of course, uh, the, <clears throat> there can be no mandates to force people into participation in research for vaccines. All the vaccines are still investigational and in research. So the ma mandates had no uh, ethical or moral or, or legal standing from that perspective. No one can be forced into research against their will uh, or be co coerced into it. But having said that, even the vaccines uh, themselves have uh, basically now become obsolete as the virus has continued to mutate. Mass vaccination has uh, created the emergence of these dominant strains, the Delta strain. There's a, a paper by Young Zhu in JAMA uh, with the, uh, you know, the prior Delta strain that was only about 20% covered by the vaccines. The vaccines were very ineffective against Delta. And now a paper from Hansen from Denmark and from the UK pu Public Health Security Report indicated against Omicron, the vaccines are basically ineffective. So at this point in time, the vaccine mandates have to be dropped uh, across the board. Uh, we can't have Americans uh, have fear about losing their job or school or travel uh, related to a failed vaccine. Uh, but even more so, we need to re-examine what we've done with respect to our public health priorities in COVID-19. Uh, on the 23rd is the March, the 24th, our Senate proceedings, really lessons learned on the COVID-19 pandemic response. Many experts will be giving 
presentations uh, in the Senate building, including myself. Now, Doctor, on that note, I want to ask you about uh, therapeutics. I think many Americans, once they contract this virus, they think that the only hope they have is, is that the vaccine will work. What should people know in the event that they do contract the virus? Do they have options to treat it? The randomized trials of the vaccines <clears throat> never showed any benefit with respect to reductions in hospitalizations and deaths. The only thing the vaccines could have done is reduce the chances of getting COVID-19. Now that uh, so many millions of Americans have taken the vaccines have been disappointed to find out they contract COVID-19 anyway, uh, we know that we have to treat it. And those uh, who are vaccinated or unvaccinated develop COVID-19, need treatment. There's very few unvaccinated people left, by the way, since the majority of people took the vaccines in the United States. Uh, but it doesn't matter. But we treat them the same. Fortunately, with the Omicron variant, it's very mild. The main treatment is oral nasal uh, virucidal washes with dilute povidone iodine or hydrogen peroxide. Twelve clinical trials show the biggest benefit of that but more than, than any other form of treatment. Uh, we still have our oral drugs available. Now there's a Pfizer and Merck drug that can be featured. Occasionally patients may need additional oral drugs in the sequence multidrug approach. And for severe cases, we can use terivimab, which is the GSK monoclonal antibody, maybe in a high risk senior or special case. But I can tell you, I have filled dozens and dozens and dozens of calls now with Omicron. By the CDC now cast forecast, we're at 98% Omicron. It's a very mild and brief syndrome. We're just over-the-counter remedies and, and, and oral nasal rinses work fine. Dr. Peter McCullough, thank you. Thank you. Starbucks is no longer requiring its workers to get a vaccine or weekly testing after the Supreme Court blocked the vaccine mandate for large employers. Starbucks Chief Operating Officer John Culver wrote in a memorandum Tuesday, we respect the court's ruling and will comply. The White House is making 400 million N95 masks available for free. Masks from the government's national stockpile will be distributed through pharmacies and community health centers. And Senator Marco Rubio and Congresswoman Claudia Tenney are calling out two congressional administrators. They say that the two administrators are bullying an American publisher on behalf of a Chinese state-controlled surveillance firm called Hikvision. The two lawmakers sent out a letter Tuesday to the offices of House of Representatives Clerk Cheryl Johnson and Senate Secretary Sanceria Ann Berry. This comes after reports that Hikvision urged those two offices to investigate Internet Protocol Video Market, or IPVM, for alleged lobbying disclosure violations. In the letter, Rubio and Tenney said in doing so, Hikvision attempted to exploit congressional processes to silence IPVM for reporting unfavorably about Hikvision, a state-run entity for the Chinese Communist Party. The two lawmakers urged the two offices to remain vigilant against future attempts by the CCP to use them to, quote, chill free speech and silence dissent. And the CDC has issued a travel warning on an additional 22 countries with rising COVID-19 cases. Over 100 countries are now listed at level four, the highest warning. The January 6th committee has just subpoenaed Rudy Giuliani and other people close to former President Donald Trump. Some are saying the committee should be a neutral body that asks tough questions from both sides of the aisle. We have author of a new book, January 6th, here to discuss. A new government group that aims to boost domestic goods purchasing has brought together officials from across the federal government. The Made in America group will focus on policies to increase domestic spending. Hello and welcome back to NTD's Capital Report. The CDC issued a travel warning on an additional 22 countries with rising cases of COVID-19. Popular destinations included in the most recent warning are Israel, Australia, Egypt, Qatar, and the Bahamas. The CDC uses levels one through four to indicate how severe the spread of the virus is in each country. Over 100 countries are now listed at level four including the U.S. and Canada. 
Fewer than 20 countries are listed at level one, including China. The House January 6th committee issued subpoenas on Tuesday to former President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and attorneys Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis, along with former campaign advisor, Boris Epstein. The committee ordered the three lawyers and Epstein to hand over documents by February 1st. It's not yet clear whether they will comply with the subpoenas. Robert Costello, a lawyer for Giuliani, said that the subpoena was political theater and that there is nothing that his client can testify about. Powell, Giuliani, and Ellis jointly spoke at a news conference for the Trump campaign on November 19, 2020. There, they vowed to challenge the presidential election. The House committee says they subpoenaed the four individuals because they claimed there was election fraud. It has been over a year since the January 6th Capitol breach, and recent frame-by-frame -frame video analysis shows that Ashley Babbitt, who was fatally shot by the Capitol Police, was actually trying to stop rioters from breaking the doors and windows leading to the Speaker's lobby. The analysis by the Epoch Times found that Babbitt was even stepping between one agitator and the police officers. She tried to prevent destruction of property and vandalism at least four times, according to the video. That was before she got shot by Capitol Police Lieutenant Michael Byrd. According to the Babbitt family's attorney, the Justice Department cleared Byrd of criminal culpability without questioning him or taking a statement. The House January 6th committee has been wielding its power with subpoenas on folks like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell. Some say that this issue has been politicized and used to divide the country. One of those people is Julie Kelly, author of the book January 6th. We had a chance to speak with her earlier. Julie Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Steve, thank you for having me on. Now, Julie, you've written a book titled January 6th. In your book, you say that this event on January 6th has been politicized by the Democrats. I guess my question for you is how so? And when it comes to January 6th, what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions from that day? So um, I, as I talk about in my book, this four hour disturbance from January 6th, where in some pockets, of course, it did get violent and both sides were to blame, is now being weaponized, as we see, very quickly, not just in the January 6th Select Committee, which is now targeting the president and all of his associates, trying to get communications, emails, meeting, phone logs dating back to April of 2020, um, but also this really abusive investigation by the Department of Justice, where we now have more than 725 people who have been arrested for even minor involvement that day. Um, most people face trespassing charges, but that's not stopping federal judges from sentencing them to jail time. The Justice Department also, in at least 100 cases, has sought something called pretrial detention, which is asking the court to deny bail for these defendants. And we're talking about defendants who did far less on January 6th than, say, what we saw over and over in the summer of 2020. But yet judges also are signing off on this. We have political prisoners in the United States who are behind bars awaiting trial for at least 18 months, denied bail by this Justice Department simply because they had the gall to protest Joe Biden's election on January 6th. Now, you mentioned the uh, January 6th Select Committee. Uh, this committee was altered at the very beginning, and the Republican leadership was never given the opportunity to appoint their own people, which had they been given that opportunity, I'm assuming, would have asked some, some tough questions from a different point of view. What types of things do you think the Democrats would be forced to answer if Congressman Jim Jordan or Jim Banks were allowed on that committee? Well, I assume that they would want the committee to uh, authorize the release of 14,000 hours of surveillance video that was captured by Capitol Police security cameras on January 6th. We're talking about an extensive camera system, both inside and outside the Capitol building. That way we could see in real time who was there, who was on the ground early on, who was inside the building. Um, if, and I think speculation about FBI involvement is justified. We now know that hundreds, if not thousands of FBI agents and informants were in the Capitol, uh, in the Capitol city on January 6th. So we could see really who were they? Where were they? 
So I think if the committee really wants to tell the American people the truth, they should release most of the 14,000 hours of surveillance video. As you know, they are concealing, refusing to release any correspondence from Nancy Pelosi's office. We need more information as to why she and D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser rejected offers, including by President Trump, to deploy thousands of National Guardsmen to the city on July, on, uh, January 5th and 6th. Why did they deny that um, offer of extra help? Why did they intentionally leave the Capitol building unsecure? Let's also see the internal investigative reports at Capitol Police and D.C. Metro Police of alleged police misconduct. And in some cases, as I talk about in my book, police brutality against uh, protesters, including defenseless women. There are a lot of things that this January 6th committee is intentionally overlooking. This is not a truth-seeking mission. It's a political mission. They're using their power with the help of DOJ to go after um, Trump associates, charge them with contempt of Congress, and of course, trying to brand uh, Republican lawmakers as insurrectionists that should not be uh, able to run for or hold public office again. Now, there are many people who believe the narrative that they've been told as they've only seen certain uh, things on video loop, certain images. What do you think people need to know outside of the many things you've told us? Is there anything else for people to understand uh, the whole picture? Um, I think people need to take a second look at what they believed, what they saw on January 6th, that this was not an organic uprising um, of Trump supporters creating violence and havoc that day incited by the president. There was a lot happening be behind the scenes. And I think a new revelation that the DOJ and FBI had elite forces, including uh, hostage rescue teams and SWAT teams stationed at Quantico the weekend before January 6th, we know this FBI and DOJ is not trustworthy. We know that they are highly partisan, weaponized uh, enforcement arm of the Democratic Party. So, Steve, if you had all of these hundreds of elite agents at Quantico Station thinking that something was going to go wrong, why did, why did they not secure the Capitol? Why did they let President Trump speak in front of hundreds of thousands of people in the middle of the city that day? So none of this adds up. We're getting drips and drabs of information and video being released. And as the trials get underway, the first trial starts next month, um, the uh, prosecutors and government are going to be forced to release video and evidence of how much uh, of a great role the government probably played in what we saw on January 6th. Julie Kelly, thank you. Thanks, Steve. The White House has formed a council of officials to guide its efforts to buy more goods that are made in America. The Made in America office brings together dozens of career and political officials from over 20 federal agencies. They will coordinate how federal agencies use their $600 billion budget to purchase goods and services. The group says on its website that it will foster policies that boost reliance on domestic supply chains and reduce taxpayer dollars spent on foreign-made goods. The group also intends to maximize opportunities for U.S. producers to supply goods and services to the federal government. On Tuesday, the U.S. Navy announced a big jump in illicit cargo seizures last year after increasing patrols in the Gulf of Oman and the Arabian Sea. The seizures are overseen by the U.S. Navy. Combined Maritime Forces and International Partner seized $193 million worth of illegal drugs. That amount is higher than all illegal drugs intercepted over the last four years combined. U.S. ships seized 8,700 illicit weapons, including dozens of advanced Russian-made missiles and thousands of Chinese assault rifles. That's all we have for you tonight on the Capitol Report. Thank you for joining us. From Washington, D.C., I'm Steve Lance, and we'll see you tomorrow.